Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Gloria Washington, who is an assistant professor at Howard University in computer science. At Howard, she runs the Affective Biometric Lab and performs research on affective computing, computer science education, and biometrics. The mission of her lab is to improve the everyday lives of underrepresented and or underserved, underserved human through the creation of technologies that utilize human psychological and behavioral characteristics for identity recognition and or understanding of human emotions. Currently, she is leading research that explores the role of affect and imposter syndromes on performance in computer science courses. Additionally, she is exploring the link between technology, mental health, and black women's hair texture. Finally, she also works closely with clinic clinicians within the Howard University Hospital to develop technologies for improving the lives of children and teenagers with sickle cell disease through creation of tools for keeping track of their pain and encouraging them in moments of depression. Her lab is currently funded by National Science Foundation, National Security Agency, and Microsoft. Before coming to Howard, she was an intelligent community postdoctoral research flow at Department of Computing Science at Clemson University. She, she performed research on identifying individuals based solely from pictures of their ears. Mm -hmm. Dr. Washington has more than 15 years in government service and has presented on her research throughout industry. Dr. Washington holds MS and PhD in computer science from the George Washington University and a bachelor's in computer information systems from Lincoln University of Missouri. Thank you again, Dr. Washington, for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you everyone for allowing me to be here. As mentioned, I am Gloria Washington, assistant professor at Howard University in computer science department. And today what I'm going to talk with you about is one of the projects that we are engaged in in my lab, the Effective Biometric Lab. So the name that the undergraduate students came up with, which is what originally was an undergraduate project, is Bison Hacks the Yard. So Howard University is known as Bison. So hacking is coding and um, the yard is what we call the actual campus. Okay, so just to give you a background, uh, I know we already had a little bit of a background of, of uh, who I am, but as mentioned, uh, I got my bachelor's of science from Lincoln University in Missouri. I'm originally from Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri, and um, got my MS and PhD from George Washington. Lincoln University is a smaller historically black college in Jefferson City, Missouri. So I am familiar with working with um, HBCUs. My area of expertise is human-centered computing, computer science education, and biometrics with um, adaptive learning in there. Um, some awards and honors that I've previously we um, received are the Young Researcher Award, um, Intelligence Community Postdoctoral Award, um, and then the National Physical Science Consortium Fellow. Uh, my personal mission or statement that I like to say about myself is that I want to help Black women get PhDs in computer science, and I love undergraduate research as a um, assistant professor, and is that a crime? Okay. So um, just a little bit of background of my trajectory of how I ended up at Howard. Um, it's a, it, it is a little bit uh, different. So I went to industry um, after graduating from Lincoln University in um, Jefferson City, Missouri. And um, I worked for companies like Booz Allen Hamilton, which is in the Washington DC area. They're also, um, I think they also have offices in Florida as well. And I worked there for eight years along the way of getting my um, PhD. And then after I graduated with my PhD, I worked in MITRE. MITRE is um, a FFRDC, federally funded research and development center, also located in the Washington DC area. 
Uh, they do a lot of government contracting, but a lot of the stuff that of what the difference between like a Blue Zone Hamilton and a MITRE is that um, MITRE provides subject matter expertise at various roles for government agencies. So you can can be farmed out to a government agency like the National Security Agency, or you can be farmed out to IARPA or DARPA as a subject matter expert in human-centered computing or biometrics. And then um, I realized at that time, after I had worked there for a little bit, but I didn't feel like I was uh, really giving back to my community. So I decided that I would do a postdoc and take a step back so that I would be considered for academic positions. So I went to Clemson and did a IC postdoctoral fellow. IC is intelligence community because it had, it was sponsored by the National Security Agency and the Office of um, Director of National Intelligence. And so that's how I ended up at Howard after completing that postdoctoral fellow um, at Clemson. So I was there for two years, did biometric research, did a lot of, with the Human Centered Computing Lab there, and realized that I wanted to work again at an HBCU, so I ended up at Howard. Just to give you some background about the mission of my lab, as mentioned, I want to improve the everyday lives of underrepresented humans. I won't go through all of the rest of it, which was already just said, but for the most part, the questions that we are asking within the lab, all the projects have to do with who is that through biometrics? Um, sometimes what are they feeling? What do they feel? How are they going to react or behave? And what can I build or develop to impact their human's feelings or behavior? Some more background. Um, the mission for those of you who probably are not familiar with Howard University. Howard University is located in Washington, D.C., in our nation's capital. The mission, it, it's pretty long, but it just it is a culturally diverse, historically black college located in Washington, D.C. It's private and it provides the educational experience of exceptional quality to undergraduate and graduate students. Within computer science, we have a Ph.D. program, so it has it also has several different graduate programs as well, um, but the mission of Howard is truly to educate um, black and brown students um, nationally and then also globally. We have students that come from all over. Um, we have students from Nigeria, Africa, Ghana, uh, Trinidad, Tobago, and then also students that are just like from the South, from the Midwest, they educate a lot of black and brown students who come to the nation's capital to be educated and learn about um, socially and culturally relevant computing. So computer science at Howard, um, within the department, the mission of our department is to create a more culturally diverse computing workforce through initiatives that immerse the students in industry, academic, and then also entrepreneurship experiences. We have a big push um, mission of computer science and a big push with our students to engage them in entrepreneurship activity. So everything that they're learning um, from an academic standpoint, we're also giving them the opportunity to learn how to take that and make it go to market or, or also develop a company and intellectual property as it relates to that. So I want to plug that is something it's a plus that we're trying to push out to um the campus as a whole but computer science is really engaged in that we are a bet accredited program uh, there are about 300 plus black and brown students and 45 percent of them are women um 20 percent of them are international and another thing is mentioned that's not on this slide is most of the students, about 80% of the students at Howard, they get some sort of financial aid. So um, we educate students that, uh, for the most part, are not rich and accept financial aid. So um, framing this talk, um, there is context that I have to give you as it relates to Silicon Valley. We do a lot of initiatives with Silicon Valley, um, which I'll get into a little bit later of what those initiatives are, but our focus is to give industry and academic experiences. So 
just giving you context for this slide. So when we think about Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley's closest cousins are Washington DC has a tech hub. Uh, as I mentioned, like companies like Booz Allen Hamilton, Northrop Grumman, MITRE are huge in this area. And a lot of our students work for those kind of companies when they graduate. However, we also get um, recruiters from Google, Facebook, Microsoft as well. Um, but we don't have as much luck in the Silicon Valley um, arena to get our students through in the door. So some of the initiatives that we were trying to understand is what are these barriers that are keeping our student from working in Silicon Valley? So um, there is a paper where it talks about the quiet crisis, but a quiet crisis exists in the US to attempt to meet the demand for qualified STEM candidates without relying on offshore options. And interest in STEM, particularly with historic, with black and brown students is very high in relation to exploring technology, information technology and computer science. But interest in STEM particularly is declining for US born college students. There is a shortage of skilled software engineers and persons with the analytical and problem solving skills to be able to work in the tech industry. Even though the DC area our um, percentages are about 7% with black um, people who actually work in tech, in the tech sector. But if you look at um, Silicon Valley, I think the numbers are closer to 3% for some companies and then 1%. Underrepresented minority uh, graduates with STEM degrees are actually increasing. So we want to capitalize as a department, computer science department, on the interests of Black and Brown students in exploring technology, and then also make sure that we retain them. So our focus, as we mentioned, was to try and see the difference with Silicon Valley and then also like our tech sector that surrounds the Howard University campus, which is Washington, D.C. area. So within Silicon Valley, as mentioned, these numbers are slightly different from numbers that were just put out from a consensus of Silicon Valley is that they're about um, overall, 2.2% Black tech workers that actually work in Silicon Valley, as mentioned, for companies like a Facebook or companies like Google, that number is even less. But then when we look at um, Hispanic tech workers, it's about 4.7%. If we look at like the difference with the Washington, D.C. area, as mentioned, there's about 17.1%. So, as I mentioned, this says tech workers, right? So uh, when they get these numbers, it can be individuals who actually work in, um, you know, like help desk or they can be an administrative support in the tech field, but um, they may not be actual software engineers. One moment, I actually lost my screen. Okay, there it is. Okay, so, a lot of what the research of what I explore is trying to get the students there and helping them understand, um, you know, does Silicon Valley have a diversity problem? Well, currently with the current numbers that have been put out, like the numbers here are like 1% for some of the top companies. Apple is about 7%, but when we look at the numbers for Apple that also would include retail, their retail stores as well are rolled up into these numbers. So these are actually black tech workers and the numbers that come out of relating people who work in admin or people who actually work in um, cleanup, like um, cleanup of the actual campus. When we get to the numbers of people who work in software engineering or some of the tech roles, it is even lower. Tech workers of color are underutilized in the workforce. So uh, this just relates to, this slide just relates to the number of people ages 45 and under with bachelor's or advanced degrees in computer and mathematical sciences and who feel that they are unemployed and who are working in jobs unrelated to their tech field. So what we find 
as I mentioned previously, is that some of our students will work in the DC area, like a Northrop. Um, we also get Microsoft, Goldman Sachs, and any other government contracting um, agency that's in that area. However, a lot of our computer science students don't go on to be software engineers. Sometimes they'll be product managers. And if you know anything about product management, it, it's more about project management and making sure that a project is actually delivered on time so you're not really coding. So, we're having some issues with um, making sure that our students who graduate with computer science degrees actually go into the field of computer science. And that actually directly relates with the quiet, the quiet crisis that is being experienced in Silicon Valley and even in the tech field in general. We have so many programmers that are being graduated but are not working in their field. The leaky pipeline for African Americans has been um, explored a lot. Uh, this is an actual example that was an exploration from the Kapoor, Kapoor Center um, that they actually did of African American and Latino students in the leaky pipeline. So some of the things that they relate to um, contributing to the leaky pipeline is engaging in relevant curricula and extracurricular activities. Um, students don't have access to advanced science courses without which students are eight times less likely to pursue computer science and education. So that relates to high school experiences and then um, role models or perceived personal relevance to anything that relates with their life. Um, so, I won't go through all of the many different areas, but I've highlighted the areas that are sort of important to this talk. So only 1.3% of all computer science AP test takers in California in 2013 were African-American or Latino. So contrasting these numbers in um, a grant that I was writing up, we needed to do some background information for the DC area. So in the DC area for the AP computer science test in 2019, I think it was at least one individual who did pass the AP computer science exam. And um, if we start to drill down into the number of high schools or middle schools that even think about providing computer science education. Um, it's very low because in the DC area, if you have skills to do programming, you are heavily sought out. You are, you can easily get a job in industry working for a government contractor, making a lot of money. So it's really hard to retain um, computer science teachers that are actually able to go into the high schools. Um, and as a result, um, disturbing representations of people of color in tech spaces. For example, nearly nine out of 10 African-American females depicted in video games are victims of violence. So a lot of the, the people, high schoolers, middle schoolers who we reach out to with the outreach activities that we have are unsure about going into computer science and technology. They don't know how they fit. They may say, well, I don't see a representation of myself in being a software engineer. Sometimes they'll wanna work with media, um, digital media and graphics. But when you say, do you wanna be a software engineer? They'll, you know, they're a little bit more sheepish and say, well, no, you know, and it is really hard with girls and getting them interested in, in um, coding. So by fixing the leaks in the pipeline, we have more tech entrepreneurs pioneering solutions to real social issues for a larger audience and then role models that accurately reflect the generation coming up behind them and a pipeline filled with diverse talent. So those three items were what this talk are, embodies, which is what I try and do for my students, both in my classes and then also in my research lab, is to show them that they belong in tech, but then also they can become tech entrepreneurs 
folks as well, provide them role models, and then have a pipeline of diverse people who are able to contribute to many different roles in computer science, not just being a strict software engineer, but being a human factors engineer, being a user experience designer, exposing them to many different roles to show them how they fit in computer science. So this slide is, as I mentioned previously, all the initiatives that Howard um, has with expanding our pipeline and making sure that our pipeline is as diverse as possible. So we'll start in the um, upper left corner. You guys have maybe possibly heard of Google Tech Exchange and Howard West. So Howard West, was a program that began at Howard University that um, spun into Google Tech Exchange. Um, the Howard West Initiative was a piloted program where students uh, would go out to Silicon Valley and be immersed in Silicon Valley experiences, culture, problem. They would essentially be taught by the software engineers, but then also have access um high level access not access to the you know some actual data but high level access sometimes to the different projects that the um engineers were on and so as part of it they they unfortunately due to covid um are virtual but the program last year ended around March and then they went virtual. So they're in a virtual experience now, but they're out in Silicon Valley being immersed in it. And we're actually developing a program through this Howard West where the students now will get credit um, like a co-op experience. And then they'll be actually treated like they are contractors or like they are employees for companies like Google and Facebook, but they'll get credit for that. It'll translate into their classes like an advanced software engineer or applied software engineering class. Uh, that program, uh, as I mentioned, spun into a uh, Google Tech Exchange program. And currently there are nine plus um, yeah, universities and institutions. So it doesn't only encompass Howard now, it encompasses HSIs, which are Hispanic serving institutions um, that are included in the program. Uh, there's Spelman, Morehouse, um, Florida A&M Prairie View, and then some of the other um, Hispanic serving institutions that are also listed on this slide. But as that pilot program, um, I I want to mention that Howard is not giving up on the Howard West program. We are looking at other companies like Amazon has expressed interest in them. So it'll be a, a partnership that is not only just connected with like a Google, but it's also connected to many different companies so that the students will be able to get many different experiences from many different software engineers and human factors engineers and people who work in diverse roles so that the students can see that they fit in Silicon Valley and that um, they have a place there. And then the next, um, we'll start with the upper right hand corner is the Google in Residence program. So the Googler in Residence program is a program that was also piloted at Howard. Uh, it was a Howard concept, just as the, the Howard West program was a Howard concept that began at Howard. Um, where a Googler would come on campus, be immersed in the environment of the HBCU and learn about how to teach an introduction to computing course. In our introduction to computing course, we teach Python. So we'll have a Googler uh, come in in the fall semester. They used to be there a whole year, but it's really hard to get a sophomore engineer to devote a whole year of their life outside of their projects. So right now it's only a semester where they'll teach our introduction to computing course with Python and they'll interact with the students. So in the example shown here is uh, we had a Googler, Sabrina, who would also have office hours. They also do mock interviews where students who sign up with the Googler can see firsthand what a tech interview is and they can practice for it. Um, and 
increase, increase their chances of getting their foot in the door. The Google in Residence program actually expanded to nine plus HBCUs. So it said, it said Florida A&M, Spelman, Morehouse, um, Google in Residence is not at A&T, unfortunately, but it expanded to 10 plus HBCUs as well. And from my understanding, they're expanding it um, to Hispanic serving institutions as well. And then lastly was a program um, that was also uh, rolled out, I believe about three years ago, faculty in residence program. So the faculty in residence program allowed faculty like myself, I was in the pilot class uh, to go out to Silicon Valley, immerse ourselves as well in the culture and some of the problems, and then be able to modify some of our curriculum so that we are we are more culturally relevant to the problems that Silicon Valley might actually encounter, but then also um, they make it more culturally relevant for our students. So that was actually a really interesting experience because we were out there for six weeks with the faculty and residence program. And then we took the curriculum that we developed and implemented it into the Howard West um, pilot program. So that's why you see me in that picture there. So I was basically out there for the entire summer um, learning how to modify the different courses that we had, which were software engineering, um, data structures, applied data structures, which was more of um, an application base where they go out and work on projects together. Anyway, these are some of the issues or some of the projects that we have implemented at Howard to try and address the leaky pipeline. However, the leaky pipeline still exists and it is not getting better, unfortunately. Um, I would say with Silicon Valley, we are still having issues with getting students um, getting their foot in the door like that they'll get internship positions but it's it's a little bit harder to um, roll over an internship position into a full-time position so we're we're still exploring um, things that we can do as a department to be able to do that so as mentioned 40 percent what we were finding when we initially uh, started was that 40% of the students dropped CS in their first year and then 15% dropped in their second year and we had to get a handle of what these issues were and most of the issues kind of fall into um, three different buckets one relates with financial where the students will have to work or care for their family so they couldn't stay at HU uh, due to financial hardship and then um, another is academic exposure as mentioned some of the students uh, came from high schools where they were not exposed to computer science and they were they did not have experience with math and our math courses were heavily loaded into the first and second year in our computing program. And students were narrowly passing and repeating these introductory courses. So we could look at a student prior to, I would say, 2015 and see that a student has taken um, like a CS1 course, which is our introduction to computing using C++, uh, more than three times. And what they'll do, they'll drop, add it again and drop add it again and then finally they'll get through it but we were seeing that a lot with sometimes with the students and then lastly um an issue or reason for retention was psychosocial and so this relates to the talk of what i'm going to do with bison hacks the yard that you're going to hear about more in these next coming slides students were um experiencing feelings of not being a part of the computing community even though they were heavily involved in howard computing community there were feelings of isolation and feelings of prejudice or bias both inside and outside of howard computing that leads me to bison hacks the world so um I like to think that Bison Hacks the World is like this umbrella where the world is an exciting place where students can learn how to analytically 
critically think and code concepts outside of the classroom. But the project that directly relates to this is Bison Hacks the Yard, where it will engage students by helping them understand that they too can be a tech influencer and a tech creator. And um, measure. we will measure through this um, initiative and model engagement of the students in their community. So um, some of you may be familiar with the positive and negative affect survey, but um, engagement is heavily tied to the way that the students are feeling um, about themselves emotionally. So we will gather metrics as it relates to their feelings about themselves and determine if there are positive and negative emotions that are contributed to them engaging with the computer science community, both inside of Howard and then also outside of Howard. So when I mention outside of Howard, I'm saying those experiences that they may have that actually relates to engaging with the Googler in residence. That, even though it's the person is located at Howard, it's still considered, because that person is not an Howard professor, they're considered a representative of their company, even though they're teaching the course. And then there is the Howard West program. So understanding the emotional experiences of the students who go through the Howard West Silicon Valley program. Um, so though, that is directly how they are connected. Okay, and then measure and model imposter syndrome with students that use technology. So a lot of times we get students that are very excited about technology and are engaged. So heart rate variability metrics and understanding stress and skin temperature metrics for understanding engagement. And skin temperature relates with um, arousal. And if you're able to gather the skin temperature of particular times before and after um, they're exposed to things, you're able to understand if they were engaged in a topic or actual concept that they're being taught. And this, this Bison Hacks the World kind of philosophy philosophy, at least with the projects that I have, um, relate not only to undergraduate education, but high school education. What's not mentioned that I don't have time to go over is um, it's a project that I'm engaging in with high schoolers to get them also to feel more comfortable about who they are as a person in being in this computing space. So I don't mention that in this presentation, but I think of it as students at all levels because if we can start to engage high school students before they get in the door and middle school students, because we also have a middle school that's also located on campus, um, before they actually get to Howard, maybe they'll feel like they are a part of the computing community and some of those psychosocial issues that they may deal with, they'll actually be able to address those before they get to Howard. Okay, so with Bison Hacks the Yard, and I know I, I wanted to make sure that um, I'm not missing any questions I hope there's no, we'll wait to the end for questions, but I just wanted to make sure I'm not missing any. Okay, so Bison Hacks the Yard, basically this project is how can active learning of data structures through augmented reality techniques improve performance to undergraduate computer science students, and then also help them improve those issues as it relates to um, whether they're represented in the computing community, whether they feel like they are a part of the computing community. So um, initially, this, as I mentioned, was an undergraduate research project where I had several students that interviewed at least 30 students, uh, undergraduate computer science students. And this number has increased where we've in probably interviewed close to 100 undergrad students who have come through Howard, both alumni and then also um, current undergraduate to understand um, how they felt about themselves when they were in computer science. So one thing to note is that within our computer science one or two course, uh, this is a requirement for our computer engineering students. So even though we interviewed students who were in a CS1 or CS2 or some of the other courses, so they might've answered the questions as it relates to whether they feel like they're a part of the community, computing community. So some students were computer engineering. 
Um, we asked students about their experience in, in their first programming course in their first in person mock interview or technical interview. So as mentioned, sometimes the Googler in residence and then also we get companies that come to campus who will um, actually give mock interviews. I think Facebook, Google, some of the companies that come to campus always give a mock interview. So you can interview at the time. And these technical interviews usually relate with a student will, um, in our space, uh, go to the board and um, iron out you know, an actual coding solution and then have to explain the solution to the, uh, to the actual tech professional. So we asked them about that, and then we also asked them about their experiences in their internships, their experiences with their extracurricular activities that they actually engaged in at Howard. So many of the men, at least 25, engaged in gaming during their spare time, but didn't feel like the average gamer nerd. So we also asked them to um, draw a picture of what they think a computer science person looks like. And so, you know, even though they were heavily involved in gaming, they still didn't feel like they were a part of it. Um, this is interesting that 99% of the students interviewed did not feel a part of the CS community. So for me, this is an interesting result because the students that are interviewed and in, in um, computer science at Howard, for the most part, are heavily involved. We rarely have students that are not heavily involved. And let me tell you how. So we have um, ACM student chapter, and most of the students uh, that are actually in CS1, 2, or some of our or other courses are involved in that because they always put on um like little social things for the students to do during the semester when we're on campus even actually now during covid um the acm student chapter provides tutoring to their fellow students who are in these introductory courses so that's why this metric or this um, number to me was surprising because they're heavily involved in ACM. We also have Society of Women Engineers. We also have NSBE. So to me, that relates with, um, even though they're heavily involved in these technology related um, programs, they still don't feel like they're a part of the CS community. And many of the women interviewed, about half were too intimidated to have a mock interview with the Google in residence. So a lot of times, as mentioned, the Google in residence will have a schedule where regardless what level you're at at Howard, you can put your name on their schedule and have a mock interview with them. It works out well because the student can actually think of what they have to study for if they're going to have a technical interview to interview for an internship or a full time position. The only thing is that is what I found from the, the women in my courses and from the study was that um, they were too intimidated and wanted to work their way up to actually interviewing with the Google and residents. Um, they would rather, they would say to me, can I get on your schedule to do the mock interview rather than, and then I'll, you know, after I interview the mock interview with you, I can then do the Google and residents. So they would want to work their way up. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so um, when you say a part of the CS community, um, does the student uh, being surveyed, do they understand what that means, um, the CS community, being part of the CS community? Is that just a, a career path in doing computer science or is it more, uh, more to it? Well, when we, when we did ask the question, we did get, what, is, what does that mean? So like, I would say, do you feel like, uh, the activities that you engaged in were part of the CS community. So an example is we have a hackathon called AfroHex that they put on every year in the spring. And um, they organize it, they even get um, people to donate, you know, like money, whatever. Even though several people were involved in this activity, which is definitely a part of the CS community, they did not feel that it would be recognized, I guess, or a part of the CS community like that. I guess they kind of feel separated, even though the things that they do is a, um, 
in direct relation to improving, you know, themselves and their fellow students, but they feel like, oh, maybe it's not recognized. So, mm. yeah. Okay. And also, yeah. um, can, you, can you give a clear definition <laughs> of what this uh, imposter syndrome is? It's just that they think they believe they are part of or they are not part of a, a, a computing uh, yes. So I'm sorry, I probably skipped over that. So imposter syndrome or imposter affect is mentioned in some of the research um, papers is that you can have all the training necessary for a position, but for some reason you still feel like you are fake once uh, you've made it or once you, whatever making it is. So you still feel like you're a fake. So like, let's say they had to do a talk with me. They would be intimidated about, um, we're a room of computer scientists. So intimidated and feeling like they're not really a computer scientist and someone's gonna find them out and say, hey, you're not a computer scientist kind of thing. Yeah. I see, I see. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, so many of the men interviewed mentioned that they did not bring their whole self. So this is a, um, I would like to say a motto that Google and some of the other tech companies always tell you, at least when I was a faculty in residence, when you get through the door, you have like this in, in indoctrination of that, you can bring your entire self to this job. Meaning if I had orange hair, or I had green hair, whatever it is that is me, I'm bringing it. But many of the men interview mentioned that they did not bring their whole self because they weren't uncomfortable with that. Um, more than 10 of the male students felt that they um, were able to finesse their technical interviews. So finesse is kind of like slang that they use as like, oh, you know, I kind of talked my way into it and they didn't attribute it to their skills. And so not attributing getting past the technical interview from an actual tech company is a, is a symptom or is an actual outward, um, I would say an outward display of imposter syndrome, at least in most of the research, um, that's what they say. And so um, what I believe is that Effective computing techniques and computer science education should um, explore how we as computer science educators can help our students to model this imposter syndrome and maybe present, um, help the students believe in themselves and that they fit within the computer science community. Okay. So that brings us to um, the idea of Bison Hacks the Yard. So Bison Hacks the Yard is like a Pokemon Go game where it will not only engage students in um, actual data structures questions for like an introductory CS1 or a CS2 course, but none of the more involved data structures that they may experience in like a advanced algorithms or algorithms and efficiency course. It wouldn't be anything as um, advanced like that. So we're starting out with some of the introductory concepts. So my vision was that a student who would be in my class would need extra credit so that they can go around campus and engage in many different activities to be able to take these abstract concepts and turn them into um, physical or things that they can actually concrete concepts so that they can remember them when they're in class. So it uses the student's location on the yard and the way that it works currently, it, it is a free software where it's available through Metaverse and Metaverse is actually um, ending. So we're gonna have to port it out of there, but that is an aside. So it uses the student's location on the yard or on the campus. And then students get points, these extra credit points outside of their CS one or two courses for completing questions and talking with tech influencers that look like them. So it was, it was hard for me to find tech influencers to provide their likeness. So what I did was go 
and um, TAP alumni. So the examples that you're going to see are virtual tech influencers that the students can interact with. And this is an example. So um, you can get a question like, walk the distance using the path shown in the app. What's the shortest path between Founders Hall and Blackburn Student Center? And so from this, this is a concept within their CS2 course that they can actually find the shortest path. And then which one is the shortest path? So they would actually have to physically go out, walk the path, determine which one is um, the shortest path, and then enter the number. And then a uh, way of data structures is if they're walking um, upwards to the, so if you're thinking about like our Howard University campus, you walk up a hill. So they pass this building called the Ernest Just Hall, which is the physics building. And so superimposed on once they hold up their app is an outline of the windows. And so what data structure would best represent the windows on Ernest Just Hall? And so these are quick little easier questions so the students can answer them and get extra credit points. So in this example, we could say, I didn't put the answers, but like this example, we could say that this could be represented as a in-dimensional array since they're exposed to this in their CS1 course or a two-dimensional array. And so they could get extra credit points in knowing that these kind of structures, if I was thinking about it, could be something concrete in my head that I think about if I have it on a test question. And so we have, as a big part of Howard University, we have um, Greek plots. And Greek life is, uh, I would say, essential to most historically black colleges because a lot of some of the people who made an impact and made history actually attended Howard or attended um, HBCU. So in this example, Katherine Johnson, even though she did not go to Howard, she went to Hampton University, but there is a, an Alpha Kappa Alpha tree that is represented on campus and you can have a virtual conversation with a likeness of Katherine Johnson. So you find out who she was, how she started um, in computing, and then you find out about her trajectory at Hampton University. So, and then there is um, tech influencers. So as previously mentioned, I wanna expose them to people who are in entrepreneurship who look just like them because if they're gonna be um, in Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley is huge with entrepreneurship. So they need to start thinking of they can create these systems and actually build them. So they can go have a virtual iced coffee with Kimberly Bryant or Michael Seibel. And um, Kimberly Bryant, for those of you, is over uh, Black Girls Code. And then Michael Seibel is, um, has a fund in an accelerator in Silicon Valley. Okay, and so then I thought, because it's really hard to create these virtual conversations that are just text-based, uh, to actually reach out to alumni. And this is an example of my student currently. Uh, she decided to get her PhD, so she'll be enrolling at Howard in the fall in her, with her PhD. But her name is Kimberly Hill, and she created an application called Curl IQ, where you take a picture of your hair, and it'll tell you your texture of, of the hair that you have. And so we see examples of having virtual conversations with these alumni who have graduated through their computer science program. And the reason why... Um, I'm sorry if I'm, uh, I'll finish up in a little bit if I'm going over time. The reason why this is important is because um, she has a company, she graduated and seeing examples of black women and black and brown people who have been successful in computer science helps them. And we want to determine if that will translate into their student performance actually within the class as well. Okay, so finishing up, the current progress is we've um, done about 10 interviews with um, alumni 
famous alumni. So when I say famous computer science alumni, alumni who have companies, there are people who are on the boards of Facebook and were happy to provide an actual video of themselves answering questions of their trajectory. So the questions are, what classes did you hate when you were at Howard? And what class did you think that you should have paid attention to? Um, what made you uh, want to go to Howard? How did you know that you wanted to be in CS? Where they currently work, stuff like that. And what is you know their long-term goal? So we have these, they're like 20 minute interviews. We're gonna divide these conversations into um, video segments. So we can use deep fake open source technology to make it like it is a real virtual conversation. Um, the tools that we are using, as I mentioned, are open source. So Metaverse is currently augmented reality, um, but it, it inputting the actual virtual conversations in a meta Metaverse is a little bit hard. And then also we are piloting these initial questions with CS2 and um, the CS1 course that we have to determine if the students were engaged, if they uh, felt less imposter syndrome by giving them a pre and post um, questionnaire. And so this is the direction um, as to where we're going with Bison Hacks the Yard currently. And questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Washington.